Anthony Bourdain was a multifaceted personality, a chef, author, TV host, and an inspiration to countless aspiring travelers. While his sharp wit and street-smart persona were well-known from his popular travel shows, A Cook's Tour, No Reservations, The Layover, and Parts Unknown, there was much more to him than met the eye. Behind the scenes, Bourdain struggled with personal demons that his fans never saw. Since his tragic death in 2018, many new and surprising details about his life have emerged. In this video, we'll explore the revelations about Anthony Bourdain that have come to light since his passing. Anthony Bourdain didn't have the fortune you'd expect. When the details of Anthony Bourdain's will were revealed, there was a surprising twist. Despite estimates suggesting his net worth was around $16 million, his will accounted for only $1.2 million, a modest amount by celebrity standards. This discrepancy may be due to smart inheritance planning, as Variety reported that Bourdain had placed some assets in a trust, which isn't required to be disclosed publicly. However, Bourdain himself once mentioned to Wealth Simple that reports of my net worth are about 10 times overstated. I think the people who calculate these things assume that I live a lot more sensibly than I do. Vanity Fair interviewed some of the fixers who accompanied Bourdain on his travels. They described him as very modest, very cautious, and noted that he was meticulous with budgets. They recalled that he was only able to open a savings account at the age of 44 and that he traveled with his crew in the same van, staying in accommodations that were more like dives than five-star hotels. Some of the rooms were so small that there was barely enough space for their luggage. Bourdain left the majority of his estate to his daughter, Ariane Boussia Bourdain. The fame was wearing on Anthony Bourdain. No one knew Anthony Bourdain quite like those who traveled with him to the farthest corners of the globe. When Vanity Fair interviewed the fixers who arranged his interviews, secured seats at family dinner tables, and provided opportunities to film intimate moments of people's lives, they all echoed the sentiment of Michiko Zento, his first fixer in Japan. Tony didn't do fake. However, as Bourdain's popularity grew and he became more recognized, those close to him noticed a change. Zento described the experience as being like a goose being made into foie gras. Tony had no time to digest anything. By the time he transitioned to CNN, those who worked with him could see that the fame and the rush to capture shots, rather than spending time getting to know the people behind the food, were taking a toll on him. Fixer Alex Roa observed that Bourdain no longer went out at night with the crew, choosing instead to order room service alone. His final bright moment was during the Hong Kong episode, directed by his girlfriend Asia Argento, where he appeared genuinely happy. The truth behind the Anthony Bourdain and Asia Argento cheating rumors. After Anthony Bourdain's suicide, social media and headlines were not only mourning the loss of one of television's most relatable stars, but also searching for someone to blame. As often happens when someone beloved passes away, the question, why, echoed everywhere. One person targeted for answers was Bourdain's girlfriend, Asia Argento. Just days before Bourdain's death, photos emerged of Argento with another man, leading to rampant speculation. When Argento addressed the accusations, she didn't deny the photos or that she had been with someone else. Instead, she emphasized that relationships are complex and outsiders can't fully understand them. People say I murdered Anthony Bourdain. I cheated on him. But he cheated on me too. It wasn't a problem for us, but I understand the world needs to find a reason. I would like to find a reason, too. I don't have it. Maybe I would feel some solace in thinking there was something that happened. Argento suggested they had an understanding, adding, He was a man who traveled 265 days a year. When we saw each other, we took great pleasure in each other's company. But we are not children. We are grown-ups. The sad, nostalgic truth of Anthony Bourdain's final episode.
When the final episode of Parts Unknown aired, it was both bittersweet and surprising. In this episode, Anthony Bourdain revisited the Lower East Side of New York City, a place that shaped his formative years. Back then, it was a neighborhood dominated by punk rockers, artists, and drug dealers. As Bourdain pointed out the street corners where he bought drugs and the alleys everyone avoided, viewers got a poignant glimpse into his psyche. Esquire noted that the episode revealed much about Bourdain, especially how punk rock music influenced his speech, writing, and thought process. They described him more as a character than an observer in this episode, highlighting how he knew the dope houses by order of preference. When he spoke of the bond shared by the residents during the 1970s, he remarked, cheap rents brought a lot of people together. This intimate look at both the area and Bourdain's life served as a fitting farewell to a remarkable journey. Anthony Bourdain was remembered as quiet and shy. Everyone who watched Anthony Bourdain on television or listened to him speak likely formed a distinct image of him. Erudite, slightly bohemian, well-spoken, and adept at connecting with anyone, anywhere. However, several months after his death, GQ interviewed people who knew him best, revealing a very different side of him. Sam Goldman, a childhood friend, recalled Bourdain as a small kid who got picked on just a bit. He remembered, The first Friday of our ski club trips, we made him ride in the luggage rack. Chris Collins, the TV producer who worked with Bourdain to develop No Reservations and Parts Unknown, also noted that his on-screen persona differed greatly from his real-life self. Their first trip to Japan was a nightmare, primarily because Bourdain did not engage with us. He would not acknowledge our presence, and he was very, very shy. This only changed in Vietnam, where he found an instant cultural touchstone that helped him come out of his shell. Anthony Bourdain spoke about his depression, discreetly. Anthony Bourdain carried a lifetime of demons with him, and past interviews hinted at the depths of his depression, especially one with a therapist filmed for a 2016 episode of Parts Unknown. While filming, he sat down with a therapist and described how seemingly insignificant things, like an airport hamburger, could trigger a spiral of depression that can last for days. I feel kind of like a freak, and I feel kind of isolated, he confessed. This wasn't the only time he hinted at his inner darkness. In a 2017 interview with The Guardian, he spoke briefly of his psychotic rage, admitting, I was an unhappy soul. I hurt, disappointed, and offended many, many, many people. And I regret a lot. It's a shame I have to live with. Anthony Bourdain wrote a series of crime thrillers. Kitchen Confidential opened the door to the culinary world for Anthony Bourdain, but before that, he had already released several books of a very different nature, crime fiction. He began with A Bone in the Throat, featuring a chef entangled in Little Italy's criminal underworld. This was followed by Gone Bamboo and later the Bobby Gold stories. Bourdain told the New York Times, Crime as work appeals to me. The guy who gets up in the morning and makes his living by crime. I've always been a crime buff and a big fan of crime jargon. And in the restaurant business, I've met a bunch of gangsters. Crime writing was just another arena where Bourdain excelled. In fact, Esquire lists his Bobby Gold collection as one of their must-read Bourdain books. Anthony Bourdain was serious about comic books. It's hard to imagine someone with Anthony Bourdain's culinary stature dreaming of another career. But when Vulture spoke with Karen Berger, editor and founder of DC Comics Vertigo, it became clear that food wasn't his first love. It was comics. Berger, who collaborated with Bourdain on his graphic novel series Get Jiro and Hungry Ghosts, recalled that he was a massive fan of darker underground comics. She noted that working on these projects was the happiest she had ever seen him. He always had a bristle at da, the celebrity chef stuff. He wanted to be known as a writer as long as I knew him, she said. 
As far back as the 1970s, Bourdain had tried his hand at both writing and illustrating graphic novels. Despite being told by publishers that he wasn't good enough as an artist, he persisted and ultimately delivered some seriously sinister and brilliant work to the world. Anthony Bourdain refused to film in Switzerland. Fans have witnessed Anthony Bourdain in some of the world's most perilous locations, fearlessly filming amidst war and conflict. However, there was one country he openly admitted to being so terrified of that he refused to film there. Switzerland. In a conversation with Conan O'Brien, Bourdain confessed to an inexplicable fear that he described as morbid. He elaborated that it wasn't just any fear, but a deep-seated aversion to everything Swiss, from picturesque alpine vistas and feathered hats to Lake Geneva, cuckoo clocks, and Swiss cheese. Bourdain speculated that this fear might stem from a repressed memory associated with the sound of music, but he honestly couldn't pinpoint why he harbored such intense apprehension towards all things Swiss. All things, Anthony Bourdain's adventurous taste started as a rebellious phase. Anthony Bourdain didn't enter the world with a charcuterie platter in one hand and a dirty martini in the other. He hailed from modest beginnings in New Jersey, where his early culinary experiences were grounded in typical American fare like meatloaf and burgers. However, his journey into the world of food began with a fascination for the aromas wafting upstairs during adult dinner parties at home. His culinary curiosity deepened further during family travels abroad. Reflecting on his childhood with The Guardian, Bourdain recounted how being excluded from these adult gatherings sparked a rebellious culinary streak in him. I responded by demanding oysters and other dishes they found revolting becoming increasingly adventurous with my tastes, he explained. For Bourdain, it wasn't merely about food. It was a way to elicit reactions and challenge norms, transforming the angsty cravings of a discontented kid into the refined palate of a sophisticated adult. Anthony Bourdain didn't drink at home. If you followed Anthony Bourdain's global adventures on Parts Unknown, you might assume he was a regular drinker. However, contrary to that image, he didn't consume alcohol at home. In an interview with Men's Journal, Bourdain clarified, You see me drinking myself stupid on my show all the time, and I have a lot of fun doing that. But I'm not sitting at home having a cocktail. Never, ever. I don't ever drink in my house. He preferred to maintain a clear boundary between his professional carousing and his personal life. Bourdain added, When I indulge, I indulge, but I don't let it bleed over into the rest of my life. The food Anthony Bourdain loved and hated. Anthony Bourdain explored cuisines from around the globe, yet he harbored a not-so-secret love for fast-food macaroni and cheese, which he confessed in his Ayama Reddit session, saying, I have an unholy and guilty attraction to fast food macaroni and cheese. There, I admit it. When it came to his other culinary preferences, Bourdain was unabashedly a fan of Shake Shack, preferring in and out over McDonald's, a chain he avoided. He famously disliked Iceland's rotten shark dish, ranking it alongside a McNugget in terms of unpleasantness. However, he didn't shy away from seeking out KFC when he craved some familiar American comfort food during his travels. In a candid moment, Bourdain was asked if he would ever consider trying human flesh. His response was characteristically pragmatic. Not knowingly, I mean, I'd really like to avoid that, but look, if we're in a lifeboat, we're three weeks at sea, I've got no problem. Anthony Bourdain despised food trends. Anthony Bourdain was known for his unfiltered opinions, especially when it came to food trends sweeping the world. During an I Am a session on Reddit, when asked about food trends he'd like to see disappear, Bourdain didn't hold back. I would like to see the pumpkin spice craze drowned in its own blood. Quickly. He also targeted juice cleanses, the overuse of artisanal, gluten-free diets for non-medical reasons, and the elitism of beer snobs and baristas. He remarked, I like a good craft, but don't make me feel bad about my beer choices. 
Bourdain's disdain for food trends extended to what he termed bro food, which he told SB Nation he disliked intensely. I don't even know what it is, but I'd like to stop it. I hate that whole idea that there's male food and female food. That doesn't reflect well on the male species. Anthony Bourdain's most treasured possession. Anthony Bourdain cherished artisanal craftsmanship deeply, a passion he showcased in his Raw Craft series. Beyond culinary arts, he highlighted the skills of artisans ranging from blacksmiths to cobblers and typographers, urging his audience to appreciate diverse forms of craftsmanship. During his I Am a Reddit session, someone inquired if he had kept the knife Bob Kramer made in the first series. Bourdain revealed he hadn't taken it home, despite bidding on it at auction where it exceeded his budget, selling for over $22,000. Determined, he eventually acquired one of his own after more than a year of waiting. It is easily my most valued physical object that I own. It is a thing of beauty, and I'm just waiting for food worthy of it, to use it. Anthony Bourdain had a disdain for brunch. Although brunch has become increasingly popular in America, especially in Anthony Bourdain's home state of New York, he had a strong aversion to it. This stemmed from the years he spent toiling away in restaurant kitchens, particularly during challenging periods in his life. Bourdain revealed in an interview with Fresh Air, that brunch was often the only work he could find at times, which he came to resent deeply. When you're cooking 300 omelets a day, scraping waffles out of the iron and making French toast and pancakes, along with hundreds of pounds of home fries, those smells and associations were very painful, he explained, reflecting on his struggles with addiction and recovery. I was a desperate man, sometimes working under an assumed name during those brunch shifts, so I really hated it, and I also hated the whole concept of brunch. Anthony Bourdain's first job was as a dishwasher. Anthony Bourdain entered the restaurant industry like many others, starting at the bottom with a sink full of dirty dishes and hot water. While this kind of demanding work isn't everyone's cup of tea, Bourdain discovered a profound sense of purpose in it and stuck with it. He described himself at the time as a shy, goofy, awkward teenager, and this job was the first that made complete practical sense to him, as he shared with The Guardian. Excelling in his tasks and meeting the expectations set for him allowed him to thrive under the mentorship of people he deeply respected and admired. It's no wonder he chose to remain in the industry after finding his footing there. A trip to Japan changed Anthony Bourdain's life. Anthony Bourdain's extensive travels spanned all seven continents, an impressive feat for someone whose wanderlust was ignited long before he became a renowned chef and globe-trotting TV host. Reflecting on what drove his insatiable desire to explore, Bourdain credited his first trip to Japan a couple of years before Kitchen Confidential as truly life-changing. In an interview with Men's Journal, he likened the experience to a mind-expanding journey akin to his first acid trip, profoundly altering his perspective. I went there thinking there were a certain amount of primary colors. I came back knowing, in fact, there were ten or twelve more, he explained. Japan showed him a world teeming with possibilities, inspiring him to embrace new experiences and deepen his understanding of diverse cultures. It was a pivotal moment that underscored the transformative power of travel, revealing to Bourdain that the world held far more richness and complexity than he had ever imagined. Kitchen Confidential gave Anthony Bourdain his big break. Anthony Bourdain's life took a monumental turn with the publication of his first cookbook, Kitchen Confidential, propelling him from the anonymity of kitchen life to global celebrity status. The book, credited with revolutionizing food writing, liberated him from the grueling hours of kitchen work that had defined his career. The genesis of Kitchen Confidential stemmed from Bourdain's desire to chronicle his life as a journeyman chef, influenced by George Orwell and his own experiences in the culinary world. Speaking on Fresh Air, Bourdain recalled, 
I just wanted to write about my life from the point of view of a working journeyman chef of no particular distinction, honestly. His writing caught the attention of The New Yorker, which published the piece, swiftly leading to a book deal that transformed his life almost overnight. Bourdain reflected, I had a book contract within days. And when the book came out, it very quickly transformed my life. I mean, changed everything. Anthony Bourdain wasn't successful until his 40s. Watching Anthony Bourdain indulging in fine dining at Noma, it's easy to overlook the years of hardship he endured in the culinary trenches, struggling to make ends meet. Reflecting on his past challenges, Bourdain shared with biography that by the age of 44, he was entrenched in kitchen work, plagued by constant financial stress. I was standing in kitchens not knowing what it was like to go to sleep without being in mortal terror. I was in horrible, endless, irrevocable debt. I had no health insurance. I didn't pay my taxes. I couldn't pay my rent, he recounted. However, Bourdain's fortunes eventually turned around. He noted, it was a nightmare, but it's all been different for about 15 years. If it looks like my life is comfortable, well, that's a very new thing for me. Those tumultuous years of uncertainty profoundly shaped his perspective and appreciation for the stability he later achieved. Anthony Bourdain knew he could have done better for women. Anthony Bourdain had a personal awakening in the wake of the Harvey Weinstein scandal, particularly through his girlfriend Asia Argento's experiences. Reflecting on the revelations, Bourdain told Slate, I've been seeing up close, due to a personal relationship, the difficulty of speaking out about these things, and that certainly brought it home in a personal way that, to my discredit, it might not have before. This realization prompted Bourdain to introspect deeply about his own actions and attitudes towards women in his industry. He questioned, What have I, how have I presented myself in such a way as to not give confidence, or why was I not the sort of person people would see as a natural ally here? So I started looking at that. Acknowledging the need for change, Bourdain recognized his past contributions to meathead culture and expressed a sincere commitment to being more supportive and aware in the future. Lebanon rerouted Anthony Bourdain's career. Anthony Bourdain traveled to Lebanon in 2006, coinciding with BBC reporter Kim Gaddis's coverage of the conflict there. Expecting to film Beirut as the burgeoning party capital of the Middle East, Bourdain instead found himself amid war's front lines. The city echoed with bombs and military jets, evoking profound terror that culminated in the crew's emergency evacuation. Despite the chaos, Bourdain's documentary earned an Emmy nomination for its focus on the people caught in the conflict's grip. Reflecting on this harrowing experience, Bourdain considered it a pivotal moment in his career. It was during this trip that he witnessed firsthand a city and its inhabitants ravaged by war, yet still resilient with hope for a better future. This experience fueled Bourdain's determination to tell the stories of those behind the headlines, aiming to broaden viewers' understanding of the world. As he expressed in an interview, his hope was that audiences would return from such journeys more enlightened about global realities. Anthony Bourdain ended his life while filming Parts You Known. The culinary world and Anthony Bourdain's legion of fans were devastated by the tragic news of his death on Friday, June 8, 2018. According to CNN, Bourdain was in France filming an episode of Parts Unknown with his close friend, French chef Eric Rippert, when the incident occurred. Rippert discovered Bourdain unresponsive in his hotel room at the Le Chambard Hotel in Kaisersburg that morning. French authorities swiftly determined the 61-year-old's death to be a suicide. Following Bourdain's passing, CNN and 0.0, the show's production company, made the decision to withhold the episode Bourdain had been working on, which was meant to spotlight France's Alsace region. Instead, they opted to honor Bourdain's legacy by assembling a final season of Parts Unknown. 
This season included five episodes compiled from previously filmed footage in Kenya, Spain, Indonesia, West Texas, and Bourdain's beloved Lower East Side of New York City. Additionally, two episodes were dedicated to reflecting on Bourdain's profound impact on the world and revisiting some of the show's most memorable moments. As the world continues to mourn the loss of Anthony Bourdain, his legacy endures through the stories he shared and the profound impact he had on culinary exploration and cultural understanding. What are your thoughts on Bourdain and his legacy? What other celebrity chefs do you admire? Share your thoughts in the comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more insightful content exploring the life and influence of Anthony Bourdain. Of Anthony